As ISRO launches Chandrayaan-3 today, we take a look at the origins of ISRO, Indian Space Agency. It is now world-renowned and how India performs successful missions to orbit the moon and Mars is well documented. But how did ISRO come into being? What were ISRO's nascent years like? Our correspondent Siddharth MP brings us a report straight from the birthplace of ISRO. Take a look. It's the southwestern coast of India. There's scenic beauty all around, pristine beaches, coconut groves and the perfect tropical weather. The place is known as Thumba. It's a small fishing hamlet in Kerala's capital city of Thiruvananthapuram. In the early 1960s, the father of India's space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, had selected Thumba for its ideal geographic location. You know, Dr. Sarabhai came to the southernmost uh, tip of India because this is the place, you know, the magnetic equator is passing through that. But that time uh, there was there were no facilities. But then he came and then uh, he had uh, discussions with the local people. And you know the history, it all started in a church here. And the, you know, when we started, it was all rudimentary facilities only were there. So they had the uh, issue of the making facilities and developing technologies. So it was, uh, you know, you have, would have seen uh, rocket nozzles carried in bicycles or in a bullock cart. So that was the humble beginning. Scientists wanted to launch small rockets from Thumba to the upper atmosphere and perform science experiments known as sounding rockets. These were very small launch vehicles, barely a few meters in length and weighed less than 100 kgs. You know the first uh, sounding rocket from Turles was launched in 1963. It was an American uh, rocket, but the payload was from France. And then subsequently there were many launches and then Turles uh, was dedicated to the United Nations. Just two years after the American origin rocket was launched from Turles, Indian scientists also started building and launching indigenous rockets. Rohini 75 was India's first indigenous rocket. It measured barely three feet in length. In 1968, the Turles facility was dedicated to the United Nations by the then Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi. This opened up the facility for scientists from various space-faring nations. Thumba became a hub of rocket launching and research activity, despite it being the Cold War era. The Thumba Equatorial Rocket Launching Station is one of the most sought-after places in the world to launch sounding rockets from. Throughout the 1960s and thereafter, scientists from more than six nations used to come here and launch rockets. Scientists from the US, Soviet Union, France, Germany, uh, all of these people used to come here despite their differences and the political differences of that time and then launch rockets. The St. Mary Magdalene Church is the most important building in ISRO's history. Inside the premises, young Indian scientists including Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, who later became the President of India, and dozens of veterans of the Indian space program worked tirelessly to take India ahead in rocketry. It was all by trial and error. It was along this coastline that Indian scientists had once carried rocket parts on bicycles and bullock carts. The St. Mary Magdalene Church in Tumba is ISRO's first office and ISRO's first laboratory. It is under this facility that a handful of scientists under the legendary leadership of Dr. Vikram Sarabhai conceived some of the most exciting projects during the nascent stage of rocketry in India. From here, the foundation stone of ISRO was laid and that is what led to the agency and what it is today. Two, one, zero, plus one. During the early 1960s, ISRO was known as INCOSPAR, Indian National Committee for Space Research. That's how the Indian space program started. As a formal space agency, ISRO was established on the 15th of August 1969. In more than five decades of its existence, ISRO has established itself as one of the leading space agencies in the world. From launching foreign origin rockets from its humble facility in Turles, ISRO has advanced by leaps and bounds. In addition to launching India's own missions, ISRO also earns revenue from commercial launches. 
From Indian soil, ISRO has launched more than 380 satellites belonging to dozens of nations, all using India's end-to-end -end space technology. From launching experimental rockets of foreign origin from a sleepy fishing hamlet to be able to reach the red planet and also the lunar orbit using India's own indigenous rockets and satellites, Indian space agency ISRO has come a long way over the last six decades. We have to keep in mind that after Moon and Mars, the Indian space agency now is gunning for sending Indian astronauts to space and bringing them back safely. We have to remember that this journey, a very ambitious and stellar journey of space flight, had its humble beginnings here at Tumba. With video journalist Surendra, Siddharth MP, Vyond, World is One. Well, our senior correspondent Siddharth MP is also joining us live. He is joining us live from Sri Harikota in Andhra Pradesh, which is the launch site of ISRO's Chandrayaan-3. Siddharth, thank you so much for joining us. Now, for better understanding, the launch is only a few hours away. Let's start by trying to understand the purpose of this countdown. Now, we've seen what happens during this countdown. The timing is always very specific. What can you tell us about that? So to talk about the countdown of a rocket launch, it's very specific as you rightly pointed out. A countdown is something that is unique to every mission. Sometimes the countdown is 36 hours, sometimes it's 5 hours, sometimes it's 25 hours, sometimes it's a couple of hours and a few minutes. So this countdown keeps varying depending on the pre-launch activity and pre-launch processes that have to take place. So at least one week prior to a launch, the launch vehicle or rocket is brought to the launch pad and it's mated to the tower and the umbilical cords where the power, fuel and other uh, you know networking systems are connected to the vehicle including the systems that conduct the health checks on the rocket and the satellite. But what happens 24 hours or perhaps 30 hours prior to launch is that uh, there is a set pattern of practices that are to be followed right from you know safety, fire safety, right from the filling of fuels on the rocket. Let's remember that most of the fuels on board rocket are highly explosive and some of the fuels on board India's rocket also are harmful for humans. Of course, there's no danger because of launching such kind of rockets, but the fact remains that the fuels themselves are cancer causing or carcinogenic. So there have to be adequate uh, precautions that have to be taken at the launch pad. And at every hour, there is a certain milestone that they will have to complete. And during these milestones, uh, fuel filling is conducted, health checks of the vehicle are conducted, health checks of the satellite are conducted. And step by step, they progress towards the launch. And as and when this happens, the computers also keep monitoring every system and subsystem of the rocket. And towards the end, towards the final hours of the countdown, all the you know fuel filling is done. And the scientists finally look at all the systems and take a call whether to go ahead with the launch or not, depending on the ideal conditions that they have. So this is what the gist of the countdown procedure is. Right. Siddharth, of course, you are at the heart of all the action. We will see you very soon for all the developments on this. Thank you so much for joining us for now. Now, as we mentioned, the countdown is underway for the launch of Chandrayaan-3. And if all goes as planned, Chandrayaan-3 will be the world's first mission to land near the lunar south pole. Now, the most crucial objective for Chandrayaan-3 will be to make a successful soft landing on the moon. If successful, India will be the first country to send a craft that explores the moon's southern region. India will also join an elite club of Three nations, only the United States, Russia and China have made a soft landing on the moon till now. Through this mission, ISRO hopes to achieve the end-to-end -end capability. This includes the capability to launch spacecrafts, land on the moon and conduct exploration missions with rovers. The Chandrayaan-3 module will begin the 384,000 kilometer distance to the moon aboard the LVM-3 rocket in just a few hours from now. Now, the entire payload of the mission weighs 3,900 kilograms. Talking about the cost, ISRO, which is also known for its low-cost mission, spent just 615 crore rupees. That's about $75 million. The duration of the mission is 14 Earth days. That's one lunar day. The Chandrayaan-3 module is expected to land on the moon in just over a month. The lander and the rover modules will attempt to make a soft landing on the lunar south pole on either the 23rd or the 24th of August, depending on the sunrise on the moon. That's very crucial here. The Chandrayaan-3 mission is comprised of three parts, the propulsion module, the lander module and the rover module. The lander is named Vikram after Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, the founder of ISRO, and the rover that's named Pragyan. 
All three modules are fitted with state-of-the-art Indian technology. The propulsion module will carry the lander and the rover modules to the moon's south pole here. But why is India choosing to make a soft landing on the moon's south pole? Because no other spacecraft has managed to do so. Now, previous spacecrafts have all aimed to land near the moon's equator. This is because the equatorial area is smoother, it has more sunlight for the instruments. The lunar poles do not get enough sunlight and as a result, the temperature can fall to even negative 230 degrees. So, the lunar poles have large craters which make for interesting exploration possibilities as well. United States Space Agency, NASA, also wants to send astronauts to the lunar south pole this is with the objective to look for frozen water or traces of it. So if the Chandrayaan-3 mission is successful, the data retrieved from the rover, it can play a very important role in the NASA mission as well. Now for more on this, we're being joined by Dr. Anita Sengupta, who is a former NASA mission manager, an airspace engineer, the CEO and founder of Hydroplane Limited, and the research professor of Astronautical Engineering USC. Ma'am, thank you so much for joining us on the show. Thank you for having me. My first question to you, the most crucial objective for Chandrayaan-3, as I mentioned as well, is to make a soft landing on the moon, the lunar south pole, in fact. What can you tell us about this? What does such a task truly entail? So it's very complicated, very difficult to do because it has to be done under precise control by the lander itself in terms of slowing itself down and understanding um, where its position is in terms of altitude, understanding its horizontal speed, its vertical speed, and being able to avoid hazards. And it has to do that all itself autonomously. Right. Now, could you also tell us a little more about the LVM-3 rocket that's carrying Chandrayaan-3 uh, spacecraft? It's among the most unique rockets in the world. It uses three types of fuel in three stages. What can you tell us about that? So I think it's really impressive what the Indian Space Agency has accomplished with the development of launch vehicle technology over a relatively short time frame. And it really does put us um, in the sort of global space race in terms of providing really capable launch services at an affordable cost for people who want to send uh, spacecrafts and uh, satellites into orbit. Right. Now, if all goes as planned, what would this mean for India's position in the space sector and for further space exploration and future missions as well? So I think it makes it a almost an equivalent launch vehicle capability to places like SpaceX and United Launch Alliance. So it really does give the global space community another way to have affordable access to space. Right. Well, Dr. Sen Gupta, thank you so much for joining us on the show with your insights and inputs on this. Thank you. And best of luck to the team. <laughs>